Chapter 22 The Aggravation of the General Crisis of Capitalism After the Second World War The Second World War and the second stage of the general crisis of capitalism Lenin foresaw that the First World War would be followed by other wars, called forth by imperialist contradictions. Everyone can see, he said, after the end of the 1914-18 war, that another war of the same kind is inevitable if the imperialists and the bourgeoisie remain in power. Lenin Speech at celebration meeting of the Moscow Soviet in honor of the anniversary of the Third International. Works, Russian edition, Vol. Triple X, page 398. The distribution of spheres of influence among the imperialist countries which resulted from the First World War proved still less lasting than that which had prevailed before the war. The role of Britain and France in world industrial production markedly declined, and their positions in the world capitalist market deteriorated. The American monopolies, which greatly enriched themselves during the war, expanded their production capacity and advanced to first place in the capitalist world in respect of export of capital. Germany, after suffering defeat in the First World War, rapidly restored its heavy industry with the help of American and also British loans and began to demand a redivision of spheres of influence. Japan took the road of aggression against China. Italy began a struggle to seize a number of colonial possessions belonging to other powers. Thus, the operation during the First World War of the law of uneven development of capitalist countries led to another sharp breakup of the equilibrium within the world system of capitalism. The formation in the capitalist world of two hostile camps led to the Second World War. The Second World War, which was prepared by the forces of international imperialist reaction, was begun by the bloc of fascist states, Germany, Japan, and Italy. In the period preceding the war, the ruling circles of the USA, Britain, and France tried to turn the aggression of German fascism and Japanese imperialism against the Soviet Union, conniving in every possible way at the actions of the aggressors and giving them the utmost encouragement to start a war. However, German imperialism began the war first against France, Britain, and the USA, and only later attacked the Soviet Union. The Second World War was a war of conquest and plunder on the part of Germany and its allies in robbery, fascist Italy and militarist Japan. It was a just war of liberation on the part of the Soviet Union and the other peoples who were subjected to the fascist onslaught. In the scale of military operations, the numbers of the armed forces involved and the amount of armaments employed, the size of the human sacrifices and the volume of destruction of material wealth, the Second World War far outstripped the first. Many countries of Europe and Asia suffered gigantic human losses and unprecedented material damage. The direct war expenditure of the states taking part in the war came to about a thousand million dollars, which does not include losses from destruction caused by military operations. The economy and culture of many peoples of Europe and Asia suffered tremendous damage from the robber rule of the German fascist and Japanese occupying forces. The war brought about a further development of state monopoly capitalism. A whole series of measures connected with the war which were taken by the bourgeois states were directed to ensuring maximum profits to the magnates of finance capital. These purposes were served by such measures as giving to the biggest monopolies war contracts worth milliards on extraordinarily advantageous terms, handing over state enterprises to the monopolies at trivial prices, distribution of raw material and labor, power in short supply in the interests of the leading companies, Compulsory closing down of hundreds and thousands of small and medium enterprises or their subjection to a few arms industry firms. The war expenditure of the belligerent capitalist powers was met by means of taxation, loans, and the issuing of paper money. In 1943-4, in the principal capitalist countries, USA, Britain, Germany, taxes absorbed about 35% of the national income. Inflation brought about a tremendous price rise. The lengthening of the working day, the militarization of labor, the increase in the burden of taxation and of the high cost of living, the fall in the level of consumption all this meant a still greater intensification of the exploitation of the working class and the bulk of the peasantry. The monopolies amassed fabulous profits during the war. The profits of the American monopolies grew from $3.3 million in 1938 to $17 million in 1941, $20.9 million in 1942. 24 feet 6 inches milliard in 1943 and 23.3 milliard in 1944. The monopolies of Britain and France and of fascist Germany, Italy and Japan also made huge profits during the war. During the war and after the war the economic and political tyranny of the monopolies and the weight of their yoke in the capitalist countries increased still more. 
a particular expansion took place in the scale of operations of the American monopolies such as United States Steel, the DuPont Chemical Concern, the General Motors and Chrysler Automobile Firms, General Electric and others. The General Motors Concern, for example, now owns 102 factories in the USA and 33 in 20 other countries. About half a million workers are employed in these enterprises. Each of the two capitalist coalitions which grappled with each other during the first period of the war hoped to smash the other and both German and American imperialism strove to achieve world domination. It was thus that they sought their way out of the general crisis. At the same time, both of the capitalist groupings reckoned on the Soviet Union perishing or being substantially weakened in the course of the war, and also on strangling the working class movement in the metropolitan countries and the national liberation movement in the colonies. Thanks to the heroic struggle waged by the Soviet people and the economic and military might of the USSR, and thanks to the upsurge of the anti-imperialist national liberation movement in Europe and Asia, these calculations of the imperialists were frustrated. The Second World War ended in the complete rout of the fascist states by the armed forces of the anti-Hitler coalition. The decisive part in this rout was played by the Soviet Union, which saved from the fascist enslavers the civilization, freedom, independence, and very existence of the peoples of Europe, Contrary to the calculations of the imperialists, who had expected it to be destroyed or weakened, the Soviet state emerged from the war stronger than before and with enhanced international prestige. The Great Patriotic War of the Soviet Union showed the strength and might of the first socialist power in the world and the enormous advantage of socialist society and the socialist form of state. The rout of the fascist aggressors unloosed the forces of the national liberation movement in Europe and Asia. The law of social development in the present epoch, discovered by Lenin, by virtue of which the revolutionary supersession of the capitalist system of economy by the socialists takes place through a gradual falling away of country after country from the world system of capitalism, was fully confirmed. Contrary to the imperialist calculations that the revolutionary movement would be weakened and routed, the war led to more countries leaving the capitalist system. The peoples of a number of countries of Central and Southeastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Albania, threw off the yoke of the reactionary regimes which oppressed them and took power into their own hands. People's democratic republics carried out fundamental social and economic changes and took the road of building the foundations of socialism. The formation of the German Democratic Republic constituted a grave setback to world imperialism and a noteworthy success for the camp of peace and democracy. It is a stronghold of the democratic forces of the German people in their struggle to form a united, democratic and peace-loving Germany. Contrary to the imperialist calculations of a further enslavement of the peoples of the colonies and dependent countries, a mighty upsurge of the national liberation struggle took place in these countries. Very great historic changes occurred in Asia, where live more than half of the population of the entire world. The first place among those changes belongs to the victory of the great Chinese people, headed by the Chinese Communist Party, over the combined forces of imperialism and the internal feudal reaction. The People's Revolution in China put an end to the rule of the feudal exploiters and foreign imperialists in the largest semi-colonial country in the world, liberating from the power of imperialism a people numbering 600 millions. The formation of the Chinese People's Republic was the most powerful blow to the entire system of imperialism since the Great October Socialist Revolution in Russia and the victory of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. People's republics arose in Korea and Vietnam. All this led to a further substantial change in the relation of forces between socialism and capitalism in favor of socialism and to the disadvantage of capitalism. As a result of the falling away from capitalism of a number of countries of Europe and Asia, more than a third of mankind have already been freed from the capitalist yoke. The period of the Second World War witnessed, especially after the breakaway of the people's democratic countries, both in Europe and in Asia, from the capitalist system, the development of the second stage of the general crisis of capitalism, which is marked by the further deepening and sharpening of this crisis. The formation of two camps in the international arena and the breakup of the single world market, a very important result of the Second World War, was the formation of the world camp of socialism and democracy, uniting the countries of Europe and Asia which have left the capitalist system and headed by the Soviet Union and the Chinese People's Republic. Hundreds of millions of working people in the capitalist world and all progressive forces in the world of today sympathize with the ideas of peace, democracy, and socialism. The camp of socialism and democracy is confronted by the camp of capitalism, 
headed by the USA the Second World War and the formation of two camps in the international arena, has had as its most important economic consequence the breakup of the single, all-embracing world market. The economic consequence of the existence of two opposite camps was that the single, all-embracing world market disintegrated, so that now we have two parallel world markets, also confronting one another. Stalin, Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, FLPH Edition, 1952, page 35. This has caused a further aggravation of the general crisis of capitalism. In the post-war period, the countries of the socialist camp have dosed their ranks economically and arranged for close collaboration and mutual aid among themselves. Economic collaboration between the countries of the socialist camp is based upon a sincere desire to help one another and bring about a common economic advance. The principal capitalist countries, the U. S.A., Britain and France, have tried to subject the Soviet Union, China, and the European countries of people's democracy to an economic blockade, expecting to be able to stifle them. But by doing this they have contributed, contrary to their intention, to forming and consolidating a new, parallel world market. Thanks to the crisis free of the economies of the countries of the socialist camp, the new world market does not experience any difficulty in finding outlets for its goods. Its capacity grows continually. As a result of the falling away of a number of countries in Europe and Asia from the system of imperialism, the sphere in which the forces of the principal capitalist countries, the USA, Britain, France, have access to world resources is considerably reduced. This affects the United States with particular sharpness, as the productive capacity of American industry grew considerably during the war. The narrowing of the sphere of access by the forces of the principal capitalist countries to world resources has brought about an intensification of the conflict between the countries which make up the imperialist camp, for outlets for their goods, for sources of raw material and for spheres of capital investment. The imperialists, and in the first place those of the USA, are trying to overcome the difficulties arising from their loss of huge markets, through intensified expansion at the expense of their competitors, acts of aggression, arms drives and militarization of the economy. But all these measures lead to a still greater aggravation of the contradictions of capitalism. The two camps, the socialist one and the capitalist one, embody two lines of economic development. One line is a line of rapid development of the productive forces, continuous advance of peaceful economic activity and steady increase in the well-being of the working masses of the Soviet Union and the people's democracies. The other line is the line of capitalist economy, holding back the development of the productive forces, a line of militarizing the economy and reducing the standard of living of the working people, in conditions of the continually deepening general crisis of the world capitalist system. The two camps, socialist and capitalist, embody two opposite trends in international politics. The aggressive circles of the USA and other imperialist states are following the road of preparing another war and intensifying reaction in the internal life of their own countries. The socialist camp is conducting a struggle against the threat of new wars and imperialist expansion, for the development of economic and cultural collaboration among the peoples, to strengthen peace and democracy. The crisis of the colonial system of imperialism becomes more acute the second stage of the general crisis of capitalism is marked by a notable sharpening of the crisis of the colonial system. The attempts made by the imperialist powers to pile on to the backs of the peoples of the dependent countries, the burden resulting from the war and its aftermath, have led to a considerable lowering of the standard of living of the working populations of the colonial world. The American monopolies are penetrating and striking root in the colonies and spheres of influence of the Western European countries, under the guise of aid to underdeveloped countries, which leads to still greater plundering of the enslaved peoples and to aggravation of the contradictions between the imperialist powers. Meanwhile, the development of industry in a number of colonial and semi-colonial countries, brought about by the war, has resulted in a growth of the proletariat, which is more and more actively opposing imperialism. As a result of all this, the contradictions between the colonies and the metropolitan countries have become more and more acute, and the struggle of the peoples of the colonial world for national liberation has become more intense. The rout of the armed forces of German and Japanese imperialism created new and favorable circumstances for the success of this struggle. As a result of the Second World War and the new upsurge of the national liberation struggle, in the colonial and dependent countries there has taken place, in fact, a breakdown of the colonial system of imperialism. 
The breakdown of the colonial system of imperialism is signalized first and foremost by the breaching of the imperialist front in a number of colonial and semi-colonial countries which have detached themselves from the world system of imperialism and established the system of people's democracy. As mentioned already, the world front of imperialism has been breached in China and also in Korea and Vietnam. The great victory of the People's Revolution in China has had an enormous influence on the whole colonial rear of imperialism. From an object of imperialist exploitation and of rivalry between groups of capitalist powers China has been transformed into an independent great power, possessed of complete national sovereignty and conducting an independent policy in the international arena. The Chinese People's Republic, linked by close ties of friendship and cooperation to the Soviet Union and all the other countries of the socialist camp, functions a powerful factor for peace and democracy in the Far East and throughout the world. The breakup of the colonial system of imperialism is further characterized by the fact that the peoples of a number of other colonial and dependent countries have won liberation from the colonial regime and taken the road of independent, sovereign development. Under the pressure of the National Liberation Movement in India, a country with a population exceeding 440 millions, British imperialism was obliged to withdraw its colonial administrative machine from that country. India was divided into two dominions, India and Pakistan. India became an independent republic, carrying on an independent policy in the international arena. Freed from colonial oppression, the Indian people are fighting to consolidate their independence industrialize their country and introduce agrarian reforms. Besides India, Indonesia, Burma and Ceylon have also got rid of the colonial regime. The imperialist powers, Britain and the USA first and foremost, are making all possible efforts to retain and extend their economic positions in these countries and deprive them of independence. This policy, however, is encountering a growing resistance on the part of the peoples of the countries concerned, who are fighting resolutely for their independence. The sharpening of the crisis of the colonial system of imperialism is characterized by an upsurge of the national liberation movement of the oppressed peoples, which has taken on fresh distinctive features. In a number of colonial countries, the leading role of the proletariat and the communist parties has grown and become stronger, which is an important condition for the success of the struggle of the enslaved peoples directed towards the expulsion of the imperialists and the introduction of democratic changes. Under the leadership of the working class, a united national democratic front is being created and the alliance of the working class with the peasantry in the anti-imperialist and anti-feudal struggle is growing stronger. In certain enslaved countries, the development of the national liberation movement has led to a prolonged armed struggle of the masses against the colonialists, Malaya, the Philippines, the peoples of Africa, Madagascar, Gold Coast, Kenya, Union of South Africa, more ground down than any by imperialist oppression, have joined the national liberation struggle. Resistance to the imperialists is growing in the Middle East, Persia, Egypt, and in North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. In Latin America, the struggle against economic overlordship and political oppression by the finance oligarchy of the United States is growing more intense. The reactionary attempts of the imperialists, headed by the imperialist circles of the USA, to frustrate the national and social rebirth of the peoples of Asia on anti-imperialist and anti-feudal foundations is inescapably suffering defeat. The failure of American armed intervention in Korea, the collapse of the plans of French and American imperialism in Indochina have vividly demonstrated that the days have passed, never to return, when the imperialists could impose their will by force of arms on the peoples of Asia and put down any endeavor on their part to win freedom and independence. The breakup of the colonial system of imperialism which has begun is leading to a situation in which the sphere of colonial exploitation is becoming narrower and narrower. This inevitably intensifies the economic and political difficulties of the capitalist countries and shakes the foundations of the imperialist system as a whole. The intensification of the unevenness of development of capitalism. The expansion of American imperialism the Second World War which was born of the uneven development of the capitalist countries itself led to a further accentuation of this unevenness. Three imperialist powers, Germany, Japan, and Italy, were defeated in the field. France suffered severe damage and Britain was very seriously weakened. At the same time, the U.S. monopolies, profiting by the war, strengthened their economic and political position in the capitalist world. In the period between 1929 and 1939, American industry, 
which possessed considerable reserves of productive capacity, essentially mark time. Enterprises worked a great deal below capacity owing to the narrowness of markets. During the Second World War, the territory of the USA was not affected by military operations, and its economy suffered no military damage. At the same time, the market for the American monopolies enormously expanded. The war brought with it a gigantic demand for arms and war materials. Also, the American monopolies were able to seize the former markets of the West European countries and their overseas colonies and spheres of influence. In these circumstances, the monopolies of the USA could rapidly expand the volume of production and carry through on a considerable scale a renewal of the productive apparatus of industry. American industrial production in 1943 was 2.2 times the level of 1939. In the principal capitalist countries of Western Europe, however, which had suffered severely in the war, industrial production was considerably reduced by the end of the war. As a result, the relative weight of the USA in the two amount of industrial production of countries of the capitalist camp grew from 41% in 1937 to 56.4% in 1948. Monopoly circles in the USA, having proclaimed a program of establishing world domination, undertook extensive economic and political expansion into the capitalist countries and colonies. Taking advantage of the weakening of their competitors, the American monopolies, in their hunt for maximum profits, seized in the first years after the war an important share of the capitalist world market. They resorted on a large scale to state monopoly forms of the export of capital in order to enslave other countries. The calculations of the American finance oligarchy about establishing domination of the capitalist world market were, however, not fulfilled. The capitalist countries of Western Europe found themselves at the end of the war having to face great losses. The war had taken heavy toll of the economy of the principal countries of Western Europe, on whose territory military operations had taken place, Germany, France, Italy, or whose territory had been subjected to attacks from the air, Britain. After the end of the war, the bourgeoisie of these countries restored the productive apparatus of industry and to a considerable extent renewed it at the expense of intensified exploitation of the working people and lowering of their standard of living. Owing to the narrowness of the internal market, these countries began to make their way again into their foreign markets, which during the war years had been seized by the American monopolies. Soon after the war, the United States came into collision in the capitalist world market with increasing competition on the part of the West European countries and in the first place of Britain. The fight for markets became still sharper when, five or six years after the end of the war, the monopolies of Western Germany and Japan joined in this fight. The expansion of American imperialism showed itself first in the guise of aid for the post-war restoration of Europe. The Marshall Plan, which operated in 1948 to 52, had for its aim to make the West European countries dependent on the American monopolies, draw them into the orbit of aggressive American policy, and force the pace of the militarization of their economies. The Marshall Plan paved the way for the North Atlantic Pact, the aggressive alliance formed in 1949 by American imperialism, with the active support of the ruling circles of Britain, for the purpose of establishing its domination over the world. When the period of the Marshall Plan's operation came to an end, it was succeeded by a program alleged to be for ensuring mutual security, under which American aid is given only for arms drives, only for preparations for another war. By the terms of this program, American imperialism finally threw off the mask of restorer of the economies of the capitalist countries. During the war, American exports were growing markedly at the expense of those of the European countries and especially those of Britain which fell sharply. In 1945, the share of the USA's exports in the total export of the capitalist countries amounted to 40.1% as against 12.6% in 1937, while that of Britain's exports fell from 9 feet 9 inches percent in 1937 to 7. For percent in 1945, after the war, however, as a result of the more acute struggle on the world market and the growth of the exports of the European countries, the share of the USA in the exports of the capitalist countries declined, amounting in 1954 to 19.5%, while Britain's exports in the same year were 10.1% of the total. The American monopolies are trying by all possible means to push up their exports of goods to the other countries of the capitalist camp, employing to this end both the enslaving terms of the loans which they make to these countries and also barefaced dumping. At the same time, the USA fences off its home market in every possible way from the import of foreign goods 
imposing exceptionally high customs duties on these goods. This one-sided nature of American external trade has brought about a chronic dollar gap in other countries, i.e., a shortage of dollars with which to pay for goods imported from the United States. The economic expansion of the monopolies of the United States leads to the breaking of historically formed, multilateral economic ties between various countries. American imperialism deprives Western Europe of the possibility of obtaining foodstuffs and raw materials from the countries of Eastern Europe, which could supply these goods in exchange for West European industrial products. One of the factors in the aggravation of difficulties of capitalist economy, since the war, is the circumstance that the imperialists have themselves cut off their access to the world market of the democratic camp. Having reduced to almost nothing their trade with the Soviet Union, the Chinese People's Republic and the European People's Democracies. In the years since the Second World War, 1946 to 54, exports from the USA have amounted, on the average, to 13.5 milliards a year, while US imports have been only 8.2 milliards. The USA imported $1.3 million worth of goods a year from the countries of Western Europe, on the average, but exported about $4 million worth to these countries. Over the eight years, the gap between the USA's exports to the countries of Western Europe and its imports from these countries amounted to $21.6 million. The exchange of goods between the USA and those countries which now form the democratic camp was in 1951 only one-tenth of what it had been in 1937. Britain's trade with them was down to one-sixth and France's to less than a quarter. The expansion of the American monopolies deals a painful blow at the interests of the other capitalist countries. The American monopolies, under the pretext of aid and through advancing credits to these countries, are striking root in their economies and conquering important positions in the colonies of the West European powers. Britain and France, for which cheap raw materials and guaranteed markets are of first-class importance, cannot put up indefinitely with the situation which has been created. The conquered countries, Western Germany, Japan, Italy, which are under the yoke of American finance capital, also cannot remain satisfied with their lot. After the Second World War, the unevenness of development within the contracted camp of imperialism became still more marked, and this inevitably led to a further growth of contradictions among the capitalist countries. The most important of these are the contradictions between the USA and Great Britain. These contradictions show themselves in the open struggle being waged between the American and British monopolies for markets for their goods, especially in the countries making up the British Empire Australia, Canada, India, etc., and for spheres of influence generally in Western Europe in the Near and Far East in Latin America. The aggressive blocks of imperialist states, scraped together by the United States and directed against the countries of the socialist camp, cannot eliminate the antagonisms and conflicts between the partners in these blocks, which have as their foundation the struggle to obtain high, monopoly profits in conditions in which the territory under the sway of capital has contracted. Thus, Lenin's proposition that the operation of the law of the uneven development of the capitalist countries in the epoch of imperialism is fraught with conflicts and armed clashes between these countries remains valid in the present period. The aggressive ruling circles of the imperialist powers, and of the USA above all, began immediately after the close of the Second World War to carry out a policy of preparing for a third. Hirelings of the monopolies try to mislead the peoples by asserting that the inevitability of war is due to the existence in the world today of two opposed systems, capitalism and socialism. The facts of history refute this fabrication. The First World War was caused by the sharpening of imperialist contradictions in a world in which the capitalist system still held undivided sway. The Second World War began as a war between two coalitions of capitalist countries. In the period since the Second World War, the countries of the socialist camp are firmly arid, consistently upholding the cause of preserving and strengthening peace between the peoples, taking as their starting point that the capitalist and socialist systems are perfectly able to coexist in peace, emulating each other economically. The policy of the Soviet Union and the people's democracies which is directed towards the development of peaceful cooperation between states regardless of their social structure, enjoys the support of the working masses and the sympathy of champions of peace throughout the world. The peace movement unites hundreds of millions of people in all countries, including many millions in the capitalist countries. People belonging to a variety of social groups and holding different political and religious views have come together on the common ground of the defense of peace and of the security of the peoples. The plans for another world war which aggressive imperialist circles are maturing will be doomed to frustration if the peoples take the cause of peace into their hands and defend it to the end. 
The democratic forces of the world are now strong enough to prevent war, if only they will act in unity and make impotent the capitalist war profiteers and would-be world conquerors. William Z. Foster, Outline Political History of the Americas, 1953, page 590. Comma.